morning, everyone. Tammy Trier, TrierWilderness.com. I apologize. I am late today. We tried. <laughs> we tried, we tried, we tried. Um, it has been quite crazy here on our homestead. This has been a very unusual and weird season for us. Good morning, Miss Courtney. Uh, this season has been such a wicked pace. It's just insane. Good morning, Miss Cammie. I don't even know how to uh, coin this season. It's just been crazy. And for those of you that do self-care and are healing, um, you know what I mean when I say that self-care takes a lot of time. So between the pace and, and taking care of myself, it's just, I feel like I am running this rat race. So right now I'm going to slow it down and I'm going to enjoy my time with you. Good morning, Miss Tammy. I want to show you guys something. I have been busy in my pantry. Hello, hello, everybody. Okay, so I've been busy in my pantry. I was really blessed. Sorry, gosh, I just got right on top of the camera. That was scary, huh? Um, I'm going to spin this around. might be safer. <laughs> Maybe. I'm going to. Okay, there we go. All right. So, I have been busy organizing, and one of the things I've been doing is I have been labeling my foods and also inventorying things. But I was very blessed to have my mother-in-law, who is very crafty and handy and has a very neat machine, print me off labels for all of my um, things in my pantry as well as my spices which I am super excited about and also my herbal pantry I'll share with you here um, this is my spice rack here and then my herbal pantry I've actually started packaging up but to be able to label all these as you can see I have little pieces of paper in there you know you make do as you as you need to but being able to keep a very well-organized food pantry as well as knowing what you have so that when there's other people in your kitchen, they are utilizing the proper things and not guessing what you have. So that has been one of my joys over the last couple of days is getting this straightened out. As you can see, I still have things. I ran out of jars or had to wash jars and I also have some things down here that need to be packaged up and put into jars. So here are my, my clean jars. So I'll be able to finish this off hopefully today or tomorrow. But as you can see, I love my old jars. This is also a ball one, I believe, too. Yeah, that's an old ball jar. So, and this here is one of my favorites. It's heavy. It's an old, like, Hoosier jar. And it's like beveled. It's just, I love it. I absolutely love it. So I'm going to take us back over to the table. And I will show you some more of my jars. Actually, I'm going to spin this around. Good morning, Miss Tammy. Woohoo! Glad to have you joining me. All right. So um, this jar here, I don't even remember where I found it. But look at it. I Hopefully you can see it. You see the bubbles in the glass? This is an old ball jar. But it was hand blown because you can see the bubbles in the glass. And the top is really different. Um, I have, I don't have any over here though, but I have a lot of the galvanized lids with the um, porcelain pieces on the inside as well. Um, but these are, these are thick, thick jars. Like, let me see. Here's, here's an example. That's an old jar, and this is a new jar. You can hopefully see the thickness on the rim. They're just, they're, they're stout, and I love the old blue jars. But I mean, I've, they're antiques. They're probably worth a lot of money because they're unique. But I'd go out and I'd be with, out, you know, out with my friends and find them for a dollar here, 50 cents there. And just, these are jars I have collected for years and years. But I love using using them, and like my old Hoosier jars are the ones I use for my flowers and my sugars and 
uh, spices, different things. But these you can actually find at Walmart, the um, replicas, and they're like, I don't know, six, eight dollars. So they're really not super expensive, but I love jars. Yes, I love my jars too. So that's been a project that I'm working on, and that makes me feel really good because I know you guys will agree that there's things in our lives that just get hmm, cluttered. Um, we, we have good intentions, but our attentions get directed elsewhere, and then things just sort of get either overwhelming or disheveled. And that was one of my areas, so that was one of the things that I wanted to get organized, and food organization is extremely important. Hey, Doc, he said, George says, can't ever have enough jars on the homestead. Exactly, exactly. Um, and you ought to see my canning jars downstairs in our food room. One of these days, I'll have to try to see if I can take you guys down there and show you around my food storage room. Um, it's a little cluttered right now because we had a Put the potatoes in so things kind of got heaped up and I have my bike in there right now to keep it out of the weather outside so I have to do a little rearranging but I keep all my canning stuff underneath our stairs our stairs here into the house are, are part of my food storage room and in that area is where I store all of my canning supplies and having jars and lids and rings and all of that stuff on hand so that you can preserve your food is really important jars <laughs> Exactly. I imagine you do too, George, because I know you, you, do you guys do meals? You guys just basically do your meats and the broths and, and, and different things, but do you also do meals in jars? That's something that I have quite a few friends that do. Um, we do soup sometimes, um, but typically, uh, we're just such a meat and potato kind of family. We do, I mean, we eat a lot of vegetables too, but um, I don't too often throw meals together because a meal in a jar, in order to feed my crew, I'd need like probably five jars of something to be make sure I had enough meat in it, you know? So it's just, I know how I have to feed my guys, and I'm sure you guys know how you need to feed your family. Meats and fish mostly haven't done the meats yet or meals yet. I forgot about you with your salmon. Oh, yum, 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 yum. Do you do? Do you smoke it first before you uh, do your fish, or do you just um, can it otherwise? But oh, smoked salmon. Mm, now you got me hungry. But keeping a good organized food pantry is really important. I know what I have downstairs because I need to know that because what's down there fills this upstairs one. And knowing what I have up here is really important, having it organized. The biggest thing that really played a role in me labeling things is this. One, I know where everything is in there, but when other people come, and my in-laws will be here for a month um, in December roughly, and when they like to make a meal or something, it makes it so much nicer when they can find what they're looking for and not have to guess. The other thing is when people rearrange things in my pantry and I have different flowers in there and most of everything has a little piece of paper in it. But if it weren't to have that in there and it got rearranged, it would be tricky for me to figure it out in some cases. Good morning, Miss Diana. So... Having things labeled, plus with the possibility of us having to pack up quickly and move, having those things labeled will make life so much easier moving forward. And it just makes me feel good. How many of you will agree when you have an area that's organized, it's labeled, it looks pretty, it makes you feel good, right? And George says he does both. Okay. He does both for the salmon so he smokes and does it and when other people get into the canning jars we get <laughs> you said about that last week that's hysterical that's hysterical George mentioned last week that he puts dog scraps he cans some of the dog scraps and people were helping and grabbed from the wrong pile so they had dog scraps to <laughs> stew the other week so that's pretty funny that stuff can happen. So yes, labeling your things is extremely important. <laughs> oh, I have a funny to share. My hands get really rough this time of year. And um, out in the hunting blind, you know, the gloves don't work on the phone. I'm doing videos while we're hunting. I'm doing videos while we're trapping. 
we've really been doing a lot of videos. My time has been spent doing a lot of editing. Good morning, Chad. So, you know, when you're out there in the hunting blind, I can't use my glove and I need to be able to, there's a reason I'm telling you this. I know I jumped from food, but um, my one glove, I hate taking them off because my hands get cold, has a hole. So I pull my pinky out and I can swipe my phone. Well, my hands get so rough this time of year that my phone is not acknowledging my leatherish skin when I'm trying to touch it. So if you see me touching the screen today over and over again, that's why I've realized this the last two days that my phone is not acknowledging my fingers. This is really sad. And I'm trying to find the softer of them, but I've been washing a lot of jars so my hands get bad. And yesterday I was helping the mountain man put a ceiling in a garage. Uh, he needed an extra set of hands. So um, my hands are just shot. Hello, driving down the road. Well, just listen in. I'm glad to have you joining. <laughs> George says it was funny, but still edible. That's hysterical. Yeah, I understand. It was just the scrap, you know, you're not as nice of meats, but the dogs get fed well, so I'm sure it was still good, but that is funny. What's funny at our house is um, last year we were blessed with mountain lions, so I have mountain lion in the freezer. For those of you that have never had mountain lion, it is amazing. It is a really tasty meat. It's kind of a more rich meat like uh, pork. It just has really good flavor. It's like a combination of pork and chicken, but it's really good. So we have mountain lion in the freezer. We have deer, mule deer, um, elk, and we have beaver meat in the freezer. So when people come that are not... Um, into all the wild game meats, they always question what we're having, and it's kind of funny. So, you know, a lot of the people, we let them try what we're serving first before we tell them what it is. But we are very into game meats, and it wouldn't be in my freezer if it wasn't good. So it's a blessing to have all those things. We have questions a lot of times on our trapping videos if we eat coyote, and that is one of the meats that we don't eat. I mean, if we were in a survival situation, it's edible, we would eat it, but no. That's one meat that we don't, they carry disease and other kinds of things. Um, but mainly what we hunt, trap, fish, we eat uh, for the most part. So um, most of the cats have really good meat. Try lynx, oh, interesting. Um, never tried that before, or the bobcat. Um, but the mountain lion was incredible, very incredible. So um, keeping good inventory on your food is important. That's why I wanted to show the food pantry today because being able to organize that, uh, um, I should have opened the cabinet that I have in there. I have a lot of old jelly cupboards. I was blessed with those, um, gosh, back in my early 20s and I've been carrying them with me all these years. But they're wonderful to have to store all kinds of things. I have one in my bathroom that has all of our medicinals in it. The one in the kitchen obviously had food. And uh, we have one downstairs that has tools in it. But the one in the kitchen was pretty full of things. I had shelves categorized for different things. But I gained so much space in that little cupboard by actually um, organizing and rejarring things and, and redoing things in that pantry. So it's a good feeling. I know you guys are decluttering and organizing with me. That was one thing that I really enjoyed doing. Plus, you know what you've got to eat you know your inventory of your food, you also go through and get rid of the stuff that has old dates. That's really important. We actually cycle our food, so that's not as much of an issue. It becomes more of an issue when we have guests and they bring in foods, a lot of the stuff that we wouldn't normally eat anyway, and they kind of, we, you know, I hate to throw food away. So what we've been doing is when people bring things that we can't eat, I just gift it to somebody right away anymore instead of leaving it in my cupboards because I found a bunch of things in the back of the cupboard that needed to be pitched for that reason. George says, here's the finger issue. Let me see if I can. <laughs> oh, this sucks. <laughs> All right, oh, there I got it. Okay, so that's why I keep wrappers from the store around. The guests see the meat wrapper and then they rave about the meat. Then I tell them what they're eating. Nice, I love it, exactly. My grandmother would freak out if she came here to eat because my, my grandmother has always like 
she would not touch any wild game. And she did have it in her lifetime, and she did very much enjoy it, but she was sworn against it for whatever reason. You know, people have, you know, you go through things in your life, you experience things in your life. Um, not everybody cooks things properly. Like I said, growing up, a lot of our deer meat was hockey pucks. I could have very easily become tainted with deer meat, but it's all in a matter of how you prepare it too. And people assume that because it's wild game, it's gonna taste gamey, but that's so not true in all cases. There is some situations, it depends what they're eating as well. If they're just feasting on sage, they're gonna have a different taste to them. If it's heavy in the rut, they may taste a little different. But typically your game meats are so, so yummy. So what do you guys do with your food? Do you keep a good inventory of your food? Do you know what you have? Do you have it well organized? Or are you just a shover where you just shove things into your cupboards, kind of eat what's available, shop as you can, or when you, let me rephrase that, you shop regularly instead of keeping things stocked yeah. up. Got to cook the wild meat slowly, no fat on it. Exactly, low and slow. And uh, on the wood stove, oh my goodness. I haven't actually done that this year yet because we, we have the wood stove going at night. And I typically have been doing roasts on the wood stove at night um, over the years. Uh, but because we just got the elk and we just did the butchering, I now have roasts. So I can start doing that again. But um, we don't have it going all day long yet. It goes in the morning and then the house stays so warm with the walls finished that I don't need to keep it going all day. So it's hard to cook my meals that way. So I'm going to have to start doing it over during the night. And man, you cook, you start a roast at like 7 o'clock at night and let it cook till like five, 4 or 5 o'clock the next day. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it is so good. So, so good. So I know today's conversations are kind of scattered. I wanted to share a couple things with you. Honestly, I didn't know what I was going to talk about until about two minutes before I got on here. I keep stocked up. We get our groceries on a, a barge weekly. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. But, um, and you get, now with the groceries, is it all kinds of groceries, George, or just vegetables? I'm just curious. That's, I always forget that you have to have things barged in. but um, And in your case, it's essential to stock up. For us, too, I really feel that is the case. I can't get this thing to open up with my leather fingers. It will eventually go here. But, um, oh, darn it. Anyway, Tammy says, I had it inventory our freezers but too many hands removing things and lose count really quickly getting ready to I imagine you say diving in oh I can't get my my leather fingers to cooperate oh there I think I got it okay to do another inventory um yeah our freezer was kind of the same way I defrosted it a couple weeks ago freezers kind of hard because if you're not the only one digging in it unless you have a chart out, you know, hanging on the freezer, but the likelihood of everybody checking off what they took out of the freezer is also hit or miss sometimes too, especially if people are rushed. So it is hard to keep track of what's in the freezer sometimes. We got 44 packs of burger out of our elk. We got, let me look, 20, we got nine, nine from the but, uh, give me a second here. I know we got 22, something like 22 roasts. I do keep track of that. You know, just every year we keep track of how much meat we put up. And it's always amazing to look back on that. Um, here it is. We got three neck roasts, nine back straps, 22 roasts, and 44 burger. So... Pretty, that, that set us up nice. Plus, we still have our deer to get. How many of you use the neck of the animal? Deer, elk, um, mule deer, how many of you, and moose. George gets to hunt moose. Um, let me see here. George says, everything comes on the barge here in Palmer. We get it twice a week, and Skagway, we only got it once. 
So do they? So do you just shop off the barge, or do they go off the barge into the stores? Just curious. It's an interesting uh, thought. Um, upright freezers make inventory easier. Yeah, because you can see and you don't have to dig down through the bottom. Very true. Ours is a chest freezer. I do have an upright freezer that was gifted to us, but it's electric, so that's going to need to go over to a friend's house. Um, in the summertime, we could run that on a regular basis, but not in the winter months. It gets too gray. <laughs> Tammy says, I had a chart on top. I need better training. <laughs> that's too funny. Good morning, Miss Kelly. We cut away the meat and grind into burger. Okay. That's on the neck meat. Always use all the meat. Yes, exactly. It goes into the stores. Okay. I just, I'm envisioning everybody heading out to the barge, so I was just curious. Um, the neck roasts are a fabulous roast. Um, two tips on doing that is to make sure that you pull the spinal cord out of the neck roast. Uh, before you freeze it, the spinal cord is what gives it a gamey taste and a weird taste to it sometimes. Um, and of course, the windpipe is something that's taken out when you are field dressing the animal. Um, some people don't even consider the neck as any part of the animal. Um, so if you don't, you want to get rid of the windpipe and, and cut up the neck roast. We use um, the Mountain Man's Wyoming pack saw to cut through the bone. And we make multiple neck roasts. Get rid of the uh, spinal cord and the windpipe, and you will have a fabulous roast. And there's a lot of meat on there. So that's one of those roasts that I put on at night and let cook all day. Put some carrots and onions and potatoes. and It's just a really good, good roast. Um, really tasty meat. Chest freezers hold more, but uprights ha have less waste. Exactly. And... I try to do as, oh, whew, I just, rough fingers just went completely off the screen. I wasn't sure if I kept you guys or lost you guys because I ended up going into another app. It's one of those days. I need to like really slow my pace. This has just been really, really wild here. Really wild. And the more we try to slow it down, it seems the crazier it gets. Um, I'm going to I'm going to jump from the food and share what happened yesterday. Um, yesterday I told you we were working I was working with the mountain man and we were doing um, putting a ceiling in in a garage. It was a, a plywood or OSB ceiling. So it's heavy, it's above the head and it was very challenging because my lat muscles and my back muscles are the ones I have the most struggle with and my back is the thing that goes out of place all the time. But as I've been sharing on YouTube, I am really trying not to have limits for myself, and I'm really trying to push myself, but also take good care of myself. And I know that's kind of twisted thinking, but the more I push myself and really work my muscles in that, the more I'm detoxing them. Um, but we worked hard all day, and going up and down the scaffolding, I've told you guys I was having problems with my legs between um, the exercise I've been getting out in the field, as well as climbing on and off of a four-wheeler, and the um, therapy that I've been doing, I'm not having the pains in my legs anymore. So that is a blessing, because I was up and down on scaffolding all day yesterday, doing this, this ceiling, and we got halfway, so tomorrow we'll be doing the same thing. But we went to leave last night, we get in the truck, and it wouldn't start. Every, you know, the power's on, everything's going on, you could hear it clicking, so of course the starter decided to die on us. And sometimes you can pound away on that starter underneath and it might, you know, give it some, you know, put it back to life a little bit. And that didn't work this time. And honestly, we're sitting there and I was seeing the great blessing in that because just about a month ago, I took the Mountain Boy to Job Corps I was five hours away. We stopped at a Walmart to just get a couple last minute things for him before we headed to the school. And the same thing happened. It, it wasn't starting and by the grace of God, it did start there and I didn't have any more problems on the way home. But to have been stranded five hours from home with that would have really been a bear. Plus I was, I don't know, 40 minutes from his school, half hour, 40 minutes from his school, which also would have sucked for him. So, you know, that was quite the blessing. But listen to this. This stuff doesn't happen very often today. It should. 
Um, you know, there's certainly reasons why it doesn't in some cases, but the lady we were working for, and if you watch this, Anna, God bless you. She, uh, she didn't skip a beat. She saw our hood up. She's like, well, it won't start. And, and he's like, well, let me work on it a little bit. And she's like, well, you can take my truck. She didn't skip a beat. She went in, she got the keys. She started the truck up. She went over, she fueled it up because the gas gauge doesn't work on it. And she wanted to make sure we had fuel and she handed us the keys. You know, such, such an amazing blessing. Yeah, I mean, we were, we would have had about a six mile hike, but we had a lot of stuff that would, would have been better off with us rather than being left in the truck. And so God is good. And, but this is the thing, you know, no matter what you're going through in life, there are going to always be ups and downs. When you think you're getting ahead, you're not going to. You know, we get in our minds that we're going to not do something until we hit this point. It will be better for us if we wait to get to that point to do it. That is not true. You need to keep pushing all the time, embracing your dreams and understanding that there are always going to be hiccups. We are working on that job in an effort to save our home, to make it through winter. And of course, it's no different than the job we had this summer that would have put us way far ahead and the whole front end of our truck needed to be replaced. This is the kind of stuff that happens. And this is the kind of stuff that we need to just acknowledge that it's part of life but to see the blessings in it, there have been so many blessings. You know, the other job this summer, the blessing was we had the money to fix that truck. Without a vehicle, you guys all know, without a vehicle, you're, you're stuck. You're, you're totally stuck. You can't go to do other jobs. You can't, you know, it's just, it, it really binds you. So the more you try to get ahead, it sometimes just seems like the further behind you get. But the thing is, if you focus on the blessings that are happening around you as a result of the chaos, your life will be so much better. I wouldn't be on here with a smile on my face. The mountain man and I talked about this yesterday. You know, so many people go through life and when these things happen, it's just this total devastation. It totally rocks their world. They are just in this horrible place. And, and as things continue to unravel, you know, it's just a negative and horrible place to be. And I'm so grateful that we don't have that mindset. I think at one point, you know, we had a little bit of that, but we've always been these optimistic people. And I'm so forever grateful for that, that God instilled that in us. But also, you know, that we acknowledge that he's ever present and he is there for us. He is working, helping us work through these things. Um, there's purpose in everything. I greatly, greatly believe that there's purpose in everything. You know, that starter failing could be the blessing in disguise that at Thanksgiving when I was going to run to get the mountain boy, um, you know, we've already discussed having to rent a car to go get him for Thanksgiving. Um, but still that's to rent a car. It's over an hour away from me. So, you know, God, there's purpose in everything. And you'll never know why everything happens, but it just does. And, we, and we've got to be willing to accept that and also not be so quick to just let the unfortunate things of life throw us into these negative tizzies. It's just, it doesn't serve a purpose. It doesn't do us any good. Um, George says limits are important. When you know what your limits are, you can then work around them. Yeah, exactly, George. And, and what, what I was, I'm going to talk more about that in a second, because there was a reason that I, I, I started all that. It happened in the hunting blind and I'll share that. Um, good uh, it's probably afternoon now. Yes, it is. Good afternoon, Vic. Thank you very much. Great article in the New Pioneer, by the way. Well done. Thank you very, very much. I'm glad to have you joining us. I've seen your name popping up in places, and I'm really glad to always have new faces joining us and look forward to getting to know you. Um, being flexible is important, George says. It couldn't be more important. You really, I mean, in life, there is just so many... <laughs> Ha, ah, it's the ring finger that works. There we go. Um, Kelly says, God is good. Even if you have plans for the money for one thing and it goes for something else, 
it's as you said, a blessing that you had the money to fix it. Amen. And that was the other thing last night. You know, she says to us, here are my keys. Let's go in and let's get you guys settled up for the last two days. The mountain man had worked Monday there and realized it was just, he needed, he needed a second set of hands. And for sure, it was quite the grueling job. And I can't have imagined have him having to do that by himself. So I'm grateful to help. It's a good uh, workout for my lats and my back muscles and my abs and my legs. Good afternoon, Teresa. So yes, absolute blessing. Um, George says, reliable transportation in the bush is important. Sometimes life or death importance. Exactly. So it's like, and also I think that's why we, we have the mindset that we do because even if that, if that vehicle were to fail, we've like, I had my backpack in the truck. So my mindset is to have things. I don't even carry a purse anymore. Um, it's a backpack of some sort, small, large, whatever, but so that it can be thrown on my back. So I'm not throwing a shoulder out trying to lug something on just a shoulder. I'm evenly dispensing the weight. I mean, that's how my mind works. So it's like, no matter what we're doing, my, my mind is on the thought that if we had to walk, how would I carry what I need? You know, now, in this situation, we had two rifles, some tools, you know, different things that just wouldn't be well, you know, it wouldn't do well just sitting in the truck. And the rifles are necessary here when we're trapping in the morning, yada, yada. So, but it is so important to have a reliable vehicle no matter where you are, but especially out here where we are. Sometimes we'll go hunting and we'll go way back in. Um, I did a video on our YouTube channel on the, uh, lighter side of Trier Wilderness, and we were just goofing off driving up the mountain, but we were back there about 18, well, we could have gone back there about 18 miles. I think we were at like 10 or 12, so, you know, it would have been a good a good hike out, and, and it's not like we can get on the phone and call somebody. Up there, maybe we might be able to find a honey hole where there's cell signal, but more than likely not, and at this point, there aren't too many people that we could call that would actually come up there to get us. So it's just, it is what it is sometimes, but focusing on, you know, in our situation, and I know there's several others out there that are in financial situations. It is a blessing to have that money to repair the vehicle that you use on a day-to-day -day basis to get you everywhere and to get you in and out of uh, places and bind. So you know, and, and unfortunately, when you're in a financial spot, you've got to determine where your money is best spent. I've got a pantry full of food. I've got a, a pantry downstairs full of food. We aren't going to starve overnight. Um, you know, so if we need to go without certain food items, uh, rather, you know, in, in order to get a truck repaired, that's what we do. So it's shuffling. It's rolling with the punches. It's, you know not allowing yourself to get into a negative place when things don't go well. Uh, if that was the case, good grief, I don't know where we would be. So just rolling is so important. Um, let me see here. Backpack with important stuff, fire starter, jacket, weapons, etc. Exactly. It's like certain things are already in my pockets. I've got certain things in my coat. And then my backpack has the rest. It's like it's constantly a mindset. And even when I'm out hiking, I have everything I need to if I had to hunker down and start a fire and try to stay warm. That's part of our, our lifestyle. That's part of that was always part of our hunting and trapping routine. And um, it's it's an important thing to have in your mind, what, regardless where you live ring finger. Let me see here. George says, <laughs> oh, my leather mitts. There we go. Okay. Sometimes trips out in the bush turn into unexpected trips. Wood gathering turned into a moose butchering trip and a moose hunting turned into a taking a cord of firewood. Exactly. Exactly. Or you go to get firewood and you get out of the truck and hear a or you're out hunting. We had guys with us a couple years back when we had first gotten here and went out on a hunting trip and they were older gentlemen. So us breaking down way back in would have meant they would have hunkered with the vehicle. We would have hiked out to, to get help. 
So exactly. And you know what? When you're out hunting and there's a tree across the road and when you're a wood snob and it's your favorite kind of, you know, wood, Mountain Man's a wood snob. And, and for good reason. It's a less uh, sooty tree, so not as much pitch. So that helps when you're burning. Oh my goodness. I'm trying to see Kelly's. Sorry guys, and I'm not fully with it. We came racing in from trapping and part of my self care is that I am just disheveled a lot lately. My body has been fighting with me. So bear with me here. I couldn't get that open. Kelly, let me see. I just, no. All right, having a well-stocked pantry is key to moving money to other places when needed. We've had it happen off and on for year, probably years, I can imagine, because so have we. And that's the benefit of having a food pantry that and that mindset. Ah, there I got it. Okay, yep, yeah, on for years. So it's like I, I said in in the new pioneer article, you know, we went for six and a half months without an income while right after my surgery in 2016. And you know, people Close family was very disgusted with how we keep a pantry and they felt it was so wasteful. But what they don't realize, they see all that food down there, but they don't realize that we don't go to the grocery store. We go downstairs and we refill from up here, you know. But that enabled us to go six and a half months and eat like kings and queens. We never went without a meal. We blessed a family that was also without in a bad situation. And, you know, still had plenty left over and we've been eating out of that food pantry for the last two years and still have plenty down there probably enough to get us through winter but you know as we can we try to put things and restock on certain things but we've got enough meat and potatoes so the rest is unnecessary so it's seeing the blessings it's living a prepared life and, and thinking ahead and planning ahead. You know, I see so many people just not thinking in the same fashion that we do. And it's hard for me to understand how they get by, I guess. Be and I know that I thought the same way they did for a good bit of my life. But once that f switch flipped, you really think differently. You really live differently. You can live so much simpler and really be prepared for whatever's coming your way. Um, let me see here. Oh my goodness, my fingers. Vic says, always be prepared is just not for the scouts. No, not at all. And, you know, good morning, Donna. Glad to have you joining me. Um, very much so. People, people don't realize. Here's a perfect example. When I was a kid, I loved the movie Terminator those sci-fi, futuristic movies, right? Uh, and I'm sure many of you did too, right? And you think that, that that's just no chance that stuff can happen. Well, they're talking about the 5G and about doctors being able to do surgeries stateside to people in other countries and to be able to you know, they're advancing things to such a degree that we are getting to that point. So it's not far off. So when people think of an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse, some people don't even know what that is. That is, the sun can do, create an EMP. But so can, um, it can be used as warfare. And what happens is, with that electric magnetic pulse, the grid goes down, vehicles are down, anything that uses power and, and has an electrical board will be toast. Our solar would be toast. These things aren't far-fetched. These things are possibilities. And the thing is that we need to acknowledge that they are possibilities and acknowledge where things are in our country at times and be willing to think out of the box you know we are not doom and gloom by any stretch we just you know 
There are preppers, there are homesteaders, there's people with preparedness mindsets. I feel that we have put that all together. You know, we stock up on things like a prepper would, but we utilize our skills and our knowledge to keep it all together and to utilize what we have and to um, fabricate things we need. So when you are able to put all those mindsets together, you are so much further ahead and will be able to survive anything that comes your way. And that's the important aspect of things that we are trying to instill in people is that life of preparedness and being and knowing and having the knowledge you need and thinking this way, not just when there's a tornado or a thunderstorm or a huge snowstorm or your car breaks down, but on a regular basis. That's what we're trying to instill in you. The faith aspect of that, because we, we are, it's faith-led preparedness. The faith is the first and most important part. You got to keep God in it and, and you know, you can be as prepared as you want to be, but if you don't have God in the equation, you are trying to do things on your own and you're most likely stepping out of his will. When you have him in it and your faith is in it and you have the mindset of preparedness, I feel you have the whole gamut uh, and, and you have all the tools you need to keep things going, to be prepared, and to survive what comes our way. Perspective and mindset play a great role in that as well. Let me see here. A, uh, yes, Kelly says, amen. I tell Courtney all the time, let's go shopping. It's a blessing when money is tight and weather and roads are bad. Exactly, exactly. Uh, when we don't have to worry about that aspect of things, and, you know, honestly, we'll go, especially right now with finances the way they are, we go to town only when we absolutely have to. And tom tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow morning, we have to go get a starter. So when we go, we will be picking up toilet paper, picking up some of the other things that we absolutely have to have while we are there. We don't just run because we need something. We make a trip and we get everything we need in one trip. We save on fuel, we save on time, and I don't know, it's just the way we live. Let me see here, George says, <laughs> only parts of my, ah, oh, got it, parts of my ring finger work. But if you lost your solar, you would still be okay. Many, whenever they lose power for any length of time, won't know what to do. You know, years ago already, somebody, we, we were doing um, something called Around the Cabin and we were educating on our life and somebody asked how we are preparing for an EMP. And I said, you know, you know there are ways to prepare for an EMP, um, but it would be a huge undertaking to build something large enough to protect our solar. And, and my response to that question right off the bat was, we would we would be fine and we would be happy in that situation there would be no internet screaming at us there would be no phone lines there would be no nothing and and that is the kind of lifestyle that we crave so you know being attached to the world is to keep our businesses running and to be able to educate you this is the way we feel god has blessed us in and and shown us that this is what we are called to do in educating and using the internet to do so. Um, but our desire is to live completely traditionally. So yes, exactly what George said. If those things did happen, we would be right where we've been dreaming to be. We know what we need to do. We have the tools here to go from modern back to traditional and still be able to keep our homestead running on a regular basis as we do on a normal basis. There wouldn't really be much of a hiccup. So, and that's, and that's the comfort we have. That's why we live it in a, a, a happy place, if you will, that we aren't afraid of anything. We aren't worried about anything. We know what's going on around us. We know what we need to do to make things happen and to work around certain situations. So 
it's the it, it's putting it all together guys it's putting it all together um, George says it's not prepping it's just a life in the bush exactly exactly and I've been in contact with a lot of preppers lately and I have I do not have anything against um, preppers but the, there are there and and not all preppers are the same there are preppers that function the way we do um, but preppers focus so heavily on stocking up and not all of them have the um, mindset, in my opinion, that they should. Um, common sense as well as the knowledge necessary to do things besides firearms and food. What you gotta think about is what you do on a daily basis on your, at your home. And you know, many of the things we do at our homes on a daily basis right now have to do with our modern society. Take that away. So what are your essentials? You know, food, water, clothing, you know, um, sharpening your chainsaws, uh, having saws available to cut wood, firewood, if you don't have a chainsaw or fuel anymore. You know, thinking like that. So you got to think about the things that you need to have to keep your family well, heated, water, you know, um, if you don't have a hand pump and power were to go off, you know, then how do you go about getting water? Is there another water source near you? You know, thinking about all these things. You know, when you start processing that stuff and really thinking about all that stuff, that's when you get yourself into a place where you will be prepared when things come your way. Um, whoa. Okay. There we go. Thinking outside the box can be a lifesaver. This is in part why Mike and I became EMTs for the training and the skills as well as volunteering on our rural service. Paid services are 60 plus miles away, so if an emergency, you'd be subject to helicopter EMS, which is very expensive. Exactly. Um, for those of you in the Pacific Northwest, there is something called lifeflight.org. Um, if you live remotely, that is something I highly encourage you to look into because it is less expensive means of helicopter um, removal, extraction, whatever is necessary in your situation. But that's exactly right. And that was really smart on your part to have that knowledge. Glenn has some, I have little, um, but that is the kind of knowledge that is gonna save you guys and possibly be something that you can utilize as a bartering tool as well if a weird situation happened. But being able to do that, we've had to suture our dogs already out in the field. I've had a staple mine years back, and we had to um, suture up copper when we were out camping a couple years back. So knowing those things and, and something like that, you can buy sutures online and you can practice on a banana. I know that sounds funny, but a banana skin is uh, like probably the most similar or the closest thing you're going to get to suturing up human skin. And like I said, I know that sounds crazy and some people will think that we're nuts to think that way, but we've already had to utilize that skill more than once. So that's exactly it. And that's exactly the way to think, Kelly, is just thinking out of the box, thinking what you, know, what you need based on your surroundings. And we are in the same boat. There are closer um, uh, emergency services to us, uh, but we'd still have 30 minute plus wait, if not longer, depending. And the closest hospital is over, you know, 35, 40 minutes away. And that hospital is not one that we choose to go to to begin with. Um, bad things have happened there already, so we choose to go further, which is over an hour. So it's, it's pretty crazy. So thinking of those things is really, really important. It would just be another day when the grid goes down. Yeah, it, you know, I mean, yeah, uh, we were without power one time here and we weren't completely out of power. We were not pulling power from the sun because one of our breakers blew and we didn't have a backup, which is just an oversight on our part. We have backups of everything else, but that was not something that we had a backup of. It was new to us. So, 
uh, three days later we got the breaker, but we were still able to use our generator. So we weren't without power, but it's crazy. Power goes out here a lot in this area. As a matter of fact, the one time I was like, wow, it just seems really quiet on Facebook. Nobody's communicating locally and going to town to find that they've been all without power for five days. So, you know, solar is really nice. It allows you to kind of beat to your own drum and, um, I will never go back from this lifestyle ever, ever. Even in my 80s, I have, will have no desire <laughs> to go backwards. Kelly said, oh, you lost me and my bet. Okay, good. All right. Life flight here in Alaska is a set fee, 125 year for a family of two. A medevac flight out costs upwards of 30000 Wow. Yeah, um, life flight I think is like 75 for a family here. So pretty awesome and and I can see it being more expensive for you guys because of your va even more vastness um, Kelly says yes I helped a friend suture a goat after a dog attack yeah having those skills are priceless knowing how to use natural medicines and everything um, is also really helpful and priceless so and, and having those things on hand that's why I have such a huge herbal pantry and a lot of supplements, tinctures, and I'm learning how over the years on a progressive fashion to be able to make things myself. Um, being able to do that is huge. Knowing what to use in certain situations is huge. Good morning, Angela. Before I forget to mention this, my girlfriend just came out with a series of books. Uh, she's a dear friend. Uh, we built a cabin for she and her family. Um, down in Wyoming uh, back in 2014 and she is such a neat lady and I'm really excited for her and I want to share these books with you because they are someone referred to them, I believe I can't find it again but I saw where somebody had referred to them as cozy apocalyptic books and there is no there's there's no uh, violence, nasty violence, there's no language, there's no sexuality in these books. So they're clean for the kids to read and they are just about different scenarios, different things happening, how to be prepared and they are very well written. I um, had the privilege of reading um, her prequel and I'm currently reading her first book. And if I'm not mistaken, let me look at that. She has, I think there's four in the series right now. Three. She has three out right now. Um, so it is uh, Wyoming Refuge is the prequel. And then Havoc in Wyoming is the series that she has started. And you can find those by going to treyerwilderness.com slash Millie Copper. The link is below. The link is also below for our lantern um, that I showed you guys last week. Um, we are taking orders. We have gotten some orders um, already and uh, they are on the website and able to be purchased and you can go to treyerwilderness.com slash lantern. They are our light in the dark lanterns and we have more products on the way. I've been diligently working on our shopping cart also to get all of the mountain man's products out there. He does a lot of blacksmith work. The lantern is something that he and I are working on together. Um, I used to do soaps and candles. I could not handle the smells after uh, my, my surgery. So I am working my way back to that. Um, I may also start making um, unscented soaps and candles because they're useful and um, I really enjoy burning candles, so I may start doing that. That might be something that I will return to the uh, store as well. But check out our store. It's treyerwilderness.com slash shop, and um, I will be adding more items on that on a regular basis. But I didn't want to forget to mention that and also Millie's books. Millie's books are absolutely awesome and really enjoying reading those. Uh, and for those of you uh, that did not or have not checked it out, um, the new Pioneer Magazine is currently featuring our family, which is an absolute blessing also and a complete um, divine intervention on God's part. 
Uh, but that magazine also has some really fabulous materials on gardening and permaculture, living off the grid. Um, there is um, Rex, oh, I just went blank on his name, but he does a solar article pretty much in every, or, or uh, alternative power article in every issue. Uh, so I, I highly recommend the magazine. The reason that I am working with that magazine is because it has been a favorite from the, their in start, and I have just been blessed to be uh, writing for them. The link for Millie's books is not working. Hmm. Okay, I will see and check that. Um, while we are chatting, let me just see. Um, thank you, Kelly. I appreciate that. Oh, absolutely. George says those plants are our friends. Absolutely. You know, there is stuff in our, oh, I see why. There is stuff in our surroundings, um, that within like so many feet of a poisonous plant is the cure, the plant that's the cure, which is absolutely amazing. God's design of everything had such purpose, and the more you tap into it and see it, the more amazing it is. Okay. Kelly, that should be working momentarily. Thank you for pointing that out. Um... Now, I have homework for today. I've, <laughs> if you look back on the last probably three or four of these Facebook Lives, I have shared the same homework at the bottom, and I kept forgetting to mention it. And honestly, since God tends to uh, run these, there was purpose in that too. So, But at the very bottom, there is some homework. George said, I spent 40 years looking at the plants. Yeah, I've, since I have been 14, I was introduced to homeopathic and holistic medicine at 14. And from that time on, I have been delving in. It was it's been a slow process, but our 10 years here, I am just, I am enthralled, awed, and fascinated by our plants. And I am learning as much as I can absorb. There's so much to be learned. I mean, you could go a lifetime and still not know everything. There is just so much to be learned about our plants. But what an amazing field to get into. And I highly recommend um, the Herbal Academy. And you can go to tryerwilderness.com slash um, H-E for Herbal Academy. Uh, they, they are amazing. I love their classes and their courses um, and highly recommend them. Now, in regard to the homework, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump our process over to this, and we'll probably jump back. But um, marriage today is jaded in so many ways. I get so frustrated when I see people losing their businesses and being sued because they wouldn't cater to a same-sex marriage. When I look at marriage today and our society today, I can't help but think of Sodom and Gomorrah. I also um, get frustrated when I see um, people taking biblical marriage and just mauling it to death and and women getting so upset because they are to submit you know with the women's rights and the women activities that are going on you know women get upset by the word the words in the bible to submit and then on the other side of that, men take the submission part and the head of the family part out of context. So there's reasons why men and women are not seeing eye to eye and why marriages are failing and why marriages are jaded and why society doesn't view 
it's funny that, you know, the Bible's being banned all over the world and, and most people say that it's not true. Somebody referred to, uh, somebody by the name of Atheist on our YouTube channel said there's no evidence and there is no God and, and you know, I just said thanks for watching and, and may God bless you. I'm not going to get into that battle with somebody. Um, but then he continued to say that the spaghetti monster loves you and he, he died for you. And what I'm getting at is that so many people, you know, refer to things as not, you know, that there is no God. And if there is no God, then why is the Bible being banned all over the place? Our goal with our videos and our sharing our faith is to help people focus on the Bible, focus on what it says, and bring our world back to what it's meant to be. The marriage, the biblical marriage in the Bible is an absolutely beautiful thing. There was a time that I had a hard time with it as well because I was living out and walking out somebody, the male taking the leader and the head of the family and the submission part of it way out of context. And, and I understand why there's women that struggle with the submission aspect of it when it is like that. But when things are lined up properly and people are living out the biblical aspect of marriage and how it is supposed to be, it is an absolutely amazing thing. Our men are to be our leaders. I want a strong man. I want a, a man that wants to lead our family. I, I think and feel that a man that hits his knees to pray is stronger than any out there. And that is what a man is supposed to be. But a man is supposed to treat the woman like the church, like God. And that's where things go awry. And, and, and people wanting women being offended that they're supposed to submit. Heck yeah. I will, I will submit to the church when I am treated like the church. And the reason I'm giving you guys homework is because we're going to talk about this next week. Down below at the very bottom of this note is your homework. I have heard many people share on biblical marriage. And part of the problem too is there are preachers out there and, and people of the faith that are sharing this incorrectly also. So there's a lot of miscommunication, dysfunction, and understanding of what biblical marriage is. We have heard a lot of different ones. Joe McGee does very a very good uh, podcast on marriage. Uh, you can find him on iTunes. He also is, I think it's JoeMcGeeMinistries.com or .org. Um, he's really funny. He's got a huge sense of humor, um, and, and his stuff is really good if you're looking for materials. And over the next two weeks, I'm going to be sharing a lot of resources. But the SSL Dad, Family Dad, on YouTube, which stands for the Self-Sufficient Family, I believe, is what they are on Facebook, did three sermons. And he did it on God's marriage, he did it on the husband's role, and he did it on the wife's role. And I feel that everybody should sit down and watch all three of these. Because it's really important to understand the dynamics that God put in place for the marriage. And I want to help our younger generation to understand that marriage is an amazing thing. That it is okay to submit when we are treated properly. And when all the dynamics are put together properly, like I said, it is an amazing thing. And biblical marriage is important. It is what God calls us to do. And it's 
it's a learning process. When you are wed to somebody and you start to learn all their habits and their ways and you're, you're now together and you are one, you know, it gets a little tricky learning all that stuff and figuring it all out. It's part of the adventure, it's part of the challenge. But when thing, and it should be fun, but when things are wrong from the beginning, um, it is what's making our divorce rates so high. And I want to encourage people to not only watch these, but encourage your young teenagers to watch these with you, your children, because it's planting seeds and, and um, I know many people who have said that they wish they would have watched these before they were married only because there was so much of a greater understanding of what was expected and we d and they didn't have the, they wouldn't have had the jaded views that society creates. I think it's an absolute blessing to be my husband's help meet and to be called to submit to him when I am being treated the way God called him to treat me. It is an amazing walk. It really, really is. Um, talk about feeling loved and talk about feeling secure. Talk about um, uh, I'm proud. I'm proud of who he is. I'm proud of his strengths. I'm proud of his prayers. And you want to learn something about your spouse? Learn to pray with them. We pray together every night, sometimes in, in the morning too, but every night before we go to bed, we pray together. And, and it's a really powerful thing because sometimes through prayer, things are spoken that may not have been spoken otherwise. And the gain from those words spoken is very powerful. Um, you learn to understand how each other thinks. And not only do you learn how each other thinks, you learn how each other feels. Another huge, huge thing that is part of biblical marriage is supporting each other in prayer. You know, to be the head of the household this day and age, it's not an easy walk. And praying for each other, for our daily struggles, our daily challenges, and just what the day puts in front of us, he lives life different than I do. We think different, we act different, we live different, we have different responsibilities. And that's what also makes it amazing in helping each other. Um, but praying for each other is one of the biggest and most powerful things we can do. Remember something, you are not put on this planet to change anybody. You are put on this planet to guide your children, but you're not put on this planet to control them or to, to change them. You are put on this planet to mold them. As far as our spouse goes, it is not our responsibility to change them at all. As a help meet, we can influence them and as they can influence us and make us better people, uh, better in our walk. Um, but it is God's doing to mold and to build and to create each person on this planet. So when we have the mindset that, you know, they aren't doing something right and we are, are trying to change them, the only thing we're most likely doing is butting heads. Where we can change things is through our prayers. When you see your spouse struggling, your words may actually be like acid or, or gasoline on the fire. But if you take that to your war room and you pray for your spouse, you will be amazed to see what God can do. I promise you. I promise you. Now, there have been some comments here. Okay. Good afternoon, Jill. Um, Kelly says, in a, in a biblical sense, submission is an honor, and if you follow God's plan, it is a blessing for the wife and the husband. Amen. Amen. That is an absolute truth. What's happening is 
in this biblical marriage, you are submitting to each other. And submission is a form of love. It's not all just sex. It's, it is a submission in everything. It is being there to help. It is showing love. And, and um, when we learn also to put others ahead of ourselves, there is a deeper love found. We are called to love. We are called to love. That is what that submission is. That submission is two people loving each other and caring for each other, not dominating, not, not with high expectations, not with a whip. That serves nothing. That serves nothing. And that's not how it is meant to be. But because people read the King James Version, and, I, and I'm going to say it this way, and women hear the word submit, their haunches go up and, and, and they have a very negative view of this. There is, I've said this before, there are so many great things that have come from women. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. But the, you know, women being included in things and, and, and women's rights. But there has also been a lot of negative coming from that. And I will be the first to say that. I am a woman. I am an independent woman. I am a strong woman, but I don't agree with everything. When we took the right away for a man to be the head of the household and, and we think that we need to dominate, we have ruined ruined not only the biblical marriage but we are ruining our men we are our men need support our men need loved our men are empowered by the support of a loving woman it's a truth so when we take things out of context and we think that we need to rule the roost and that we own the pants we're doing it all wrong and you know what? You can still be a powerful, strong, and amazing woman without having to rule the roost. My opinion. And I know that was strong, but it's my opinion. And I, and I really feel that if we as a society could shift things back to the way they were designed to be, things would be very different. Now, let's see here. Um, and chime in. Please add your thoughts. Oh, trying to get the ring finger to, ah, oh, there, got it. Okay, so Diana says, we are to submit to one another. Our submission looks different. Wives are to see to it that we respect our husbands and husbands' submissions is to love his wife like Christ loves the church. Amen. Amen. And that's exactly it. And when we are doing things properly, there is a mutual respect. And when we are walking this out properly, Properly, we are a light to people around us. And I want to see our marriages go, grow strong. I see there's so much around me. And, I, and like I said, I've wanted to do this for four weeks. I really believe that God's timing is perfect. Um, this has been something heavy on my heart. And these sermons, well, they were probably done about a month or so ago, maybe maybe two now, I'm not sure. Uh, it's probably two because the mountain boy was still here. But these are done so incredibly well, and they spell out biblical marriage so perfectly. And his, his way of doing this is just very, very well done. So I encourage you to watch those videos, I, and it's your homework. I'm going to give you guys a lot of resources upcoming of books and programs and different tools available to strengthen your marriage. Not everybody needs, um, you know, their, their, their marriage may be good, but we can always improve. And then I want to help others to improve their marriage. There's a lot of disconnects going on in this world. And and, and, and the divorce rates are so high, and a lot of people are just avoiding marriage. Um, what's really crazy is there's just such a, I don't know if it's the thought process or what, but I mean, I know of people that lived together for 12 plus years, 
and they finally go ahead and they get married and a year later they're divorced. There's so much pressure under the world's view of marriage and I think that if we could bring it all back to biblical marriage and what it's really supposed to be like, I know things would change. And I know that there would be a lot of happier people on this planet and a lot of people not willing to give up. You know, um, marriage anymore to me, when I see people talking about it and see the youth of today, it's like an old pair of sneakers. And it shouldn't be that way. And, and something that we all need to realize is that marriage takes work. Nobody said it would be easy. But that's one thing that is such a blessing for me and the mountain man is that we are devoted to one another. We know both of us have been harmed in previous relationships. And one of the greatest things we have is the confidence in each other to know that neither one is giving up on this. That was something that before we said, I do, that we both made it really clear that we were in this for forever. So to have that as a, a comfort um, based on what we've both experienced is huge. And then to be walking it out in the biblical fashion that we both have respect for each other is really, really huge also. Because as I said, I lived the other side of that and it is not a pleasant place to be. And I feel for other people that are in that situation, but it does go both ways. You know, there are people that are taking it, either the men are taking it out of context or the women are refusing to, to uh, submit because they misunderstand it and are trying to run the household. And that's not how it's meant to be. And it truly does make a difference when um, you're working this together. And that you know that, you know, you're going to have ups and downs. You're going to have spats. You're going to have all-out brawls. But when you realize that what you're fighting for is a lifelong thing, you learn to fight differently. <laughs> you're fighting for something instead of with each other. And that's what I want to help people to be able to understand. Kelly says, God is moving among his people. Uh, my finger is not. I'm trying. I want to be able, there we go. Got it. Okay. Sorry. Um, like I said earlier, my fingers are like leather and my machine is not acknowledging them as fingers. Um, Kelly says, God is moving among his people. Just watched a video on the roles in marriage and it was also about how churches portray these roles incorrectly. Awesome. I'm so glad because, you know, truthfully, I want people to have what I have. I could not imagine, and you've heard me say this over and over again, I could not imagine what this journey that we've been on for the last three years would be like if we weren't walking this out in unison and together. I was editing a video the other day, and it just confirmed how I feel. We said the exact same thing at two separate times in the video that our lips were exactly synced. It was crazy. And that's how I feel we are walking this out. We are so in sync with each other and with our, our faith that we are looking to God constantly, thanking God constantly, and putting God first always. And I couldn't imagine our lives if we weren't walking it out this way. Honestly, guys, you know, um, the day-to-day -day of life can be hard enough, but when you're walking out a tough journey for a long period of time, if you don't have God in it, I don't know how you will make it through it, honestly. Honestly, and if you do, I, I, will, I, I would feel for you because I just know how much harder it would be without him in it. But it's an amazing thing, though, when you have a partner and you have a spouse that is walking it out with you. I, one of my greatest prayers, you know, when I met the mountain man was to find a man that would allow me to wear my faith on my sleeve and for the first time in my life, walk out my faith the way I feel it needs to be walked out. Not having to hide it, not having to conceal it, not having to worry if I say anything that I will offend or whatever. I wanted to, 
I wanted to live out my faith and I'm so blessed to have been blessed with him that we are able to walk out our faith together and it's amazing. It's amazing. Praying together is very powerful and it is such a blessing, Kelly says. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's so much growth in prayer. Both praying for somebody but praying together. If you got to try it because you gain so much more knowledge through listening to your spouse's prayers than you do in conversation. Very true. I, I really believe that. Uh, Kelly says, through our growth and the spouse seeing the change is such a witness. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. And when you know that you can help your spouse through troubles by just taking it to God um, and them knowing that you are one of their deepest prayer warriors, I, I mean, I would... I've got his back on a regular basis, but I I lift him daily for in prayer. You know, um, it's a great feeling. It's a great feeling. Kelly said it is everything. It is about total trust, a deep love, love like God wants us to share. Very much so. And part of the uh, header today or the title was zero plus Jesus equals everything. You know, when you do that math and you think about that, no matter what you're walking out, the only answer is him. And when you're struggling with anything, Getting on our knees is the most powerful tool we have and putting on our armor. But to have a spouse that supports that and also is armoring up with you on his knees with you or her, you know, that is one marriage that is going to have a hard time being reckoned with. And that's why God designed it the way he did. Because the enemy, if you watch society and you watch what is happening in our world and you pay attention and you watch the families that are struggling around you, you can see the enemy just seeping in. And that's something else I want, you know, I talk a lot about this is that, and that is being able to discern when the enemy is working his way in sitting on one of your shoulders, whispering something negative and, and causing you to question or um, causing you to be at wits with each other. You know, that's one of our biggest clues. You know, all of a sudden we'll be, we'll be doing good and all of a sudden there's conflict. It's like, dude, something's up, you know, instantly. We're both so in tune with that. The other thing that's really crazy, our dogs, our dogs are in tune with it. Our old dog, the healer, who is now almost blind and almost deaf, will start pacing. It's really crazy. So learning to discern when the enemy is what is causing your conflicts. I mean, conflict is evil. Conflict is coming from the enemy. God is not going to cause conflict for you. God wants you to have a loving, happy marriage. So you need to realize that the enemy... His number one thing to attack is going to be marriage and family. Because when those are broken, the world is broken. And then all the destruction sets in. And he's, he's working so hard that he's actually keeping people from biblical marriage. And churches are out there doing same-sex marriages. That's wrong. That's biblically wrong. And I am going to stand on that truth. And I am saddened by that truth. But that's churches wanting to keep up with the times and to keep people in their church. But that's not right. And, and you know what? I've said this before. I know gay people. And I am friends with gay people. I do not support their sin. But I love them. I am friends with them. But I do not support their sin. Okay, I'm taking a pause. Um, let me see if I'm going to open this on my iPad. 
Part of our prayers today is for Terry. Terry had his surgery yesterday and June is with him. And he just messaged and said, my surgery went well. They told my wife there was more damage than they thought. My bicep was damaged along with the ligaments they said were was torn more than it showed. So they gave me a nerve blocker before the surgery. So he has a sling on for at least five weeks or longer, depending on how he's healing. So what a blessing that his, his surgery went well. And uh, I, I've shared with you before, we need to lift Terry and June. Um, he has been asking for uh, continuous prayer uh, for over a year now for he and June with their marriage. So I love that he's very open about it. And uh, I've been asking you guys to pray that while she is here and caring for him that God uses this time to rekindle their relationship and their marriage. So please keep them in prayer. And if you know other people that are struggling and that need prayers, um, please don't hesitate to leave them in the comments. Also, um, you can email me at prayers at treyerwilderness.com or you can private message me. But you guys are powerful, powerful prayer warriors. We are moving. We, we are moving things. We are m making miracles happen. We are um, seeing so many miracles. It's just amazing. But we are becoming an environment where people message me and ask me to have my prayer warriors pray for them. This is a huge, huge thing. This is not just me. They know that my family and I are very faithful and will pray for them. And I don't just say that I will pray. We pray. They go on a list. There is a list at the bottom of this um, in the description. So um, for some, it may be hard to pray for everybody. So just pray for them as a whole. Um, others uh, enjoy praying for individuals. Uh, we do have some people added on there. We have Terry and June. We have uh, Janice Snow's son. We have Chelsea and Alexis that need prayers. Um, Shelly needs prayers. She is not on here today. She is um, preparing for surgery herself. So please keep Shelly in your prayers. And Stephen Candy Hill uh, need prayers. He has been battling an infection for I think over a year now. And he was doing really well and he was back in the hospital. I think he's back home right now, but it's been just such a grueling experience for them, but their faith is so strong and they're amazing people. So if you could keep them in prayer. Tiffany needs prayer. She is dealing with breast implant illness and could use some heavy prayers for healing. And I don't know who this person is, but um, somewhere over the rainbow is their username on YouTube and they were in the hospital for 72 days, I believe. Um, if I'm recalling correctly, we get so many prayer requests. So forgive me if I get the details a little mixed up. Um, it's hard to remember them all, but I do have a note that I go off of. And sometimes I don't always know if I have the permission to share all the details. So um, if you could just keep them in prayer, you know, we don't need to know all the details. God knows their details and uh, we just need to remember to lift them in prayer. Um, and uh, Charles and Mona and Ken also need prayer. And uh, if we could pray for Tammy, I notice she's not on here today either. She is not feeling well. Um, and if you could keep me in prayer too, my health has been doing some really weird things. I don't focus on it. I don't talk a lot about it. Um, I've been doing a lot of self-care. I've been trying to slow the pace, but we are fighting desperately to keep our home. So it's a little hard to slow down. Um, but if you could just keep me in your prayers for my health, I would greatly appreciate it. It's hard keeping this pace and my body is fighting it. Um, I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting anybody. Austin could use prayer too. Um, he's doing really well up in, in, uh, at Job Corps and he has choose heavy equipment um, repair and is getting involved in that. Um, the first month is just really slow, really boring, and you know, you get to know people and making friends and 
but I'm really proud of him. He has been doing really, really good. And um, just the fact that he's there, uh, the first week was very tough because it was just way boring, but he's been getting to um, meet other people and do other things. And so just keep him in your prayers. Uh, we're, he also feels that he's meant to be a light up there. And there are a lot of, a lot of troubled uh, young people people up there and it would be awesome if God would use them in that way. Um, Kelly says, absolutely. I have a notebook. Oop, my battery is dying. And my thing. I have a notebook in my Bible. So we pray for each. God knows the need. I'm just going to move this. Bear with me a second here. I don't have any devotionals to read today. Um, I wasn't sure, as I said, what he was going to have me teach on. Hello, Heidi May. Let me see. There we go. So um, it came to me two minutes before, and evidently I wasn't supposed to share any devotionals today. But I think that we've covered a lot, and I would really like to see all of you delve in and watch all three of those videos. They are not super long. I think you're looking at an hour and a half total. And include your children. Um, if you have a youth group at your church that um, I think it would be really good for our youth to watch these videos. I am not only going to talk about this here on Facebook Live, but I am going to do a post on our Facebook page and uh, really try to bring more awareness to this because I really feel we need to concentrate on this. I really see so many things um, going awry and, and, you know, sitting in the seat that we do living back here off grid, not part of the world on a daily basis. I just think we see things a little clearer and it's just, it's saddening. And there's so much beauty in, in what God designed the biblical marriage to look like. And, um, it's an amazing thing when you're walking it out. And I, I can say that I, I lived through other experiences previously, and I'm very thankful to be able to be walking this out now. Um, and I know there are many that are walking in some really rough places. And um, remember that you have great power in prayer, and that by praying for your spouse, um, you can make some great changes. Next week, we will talk about some resources, tools, some great books, um, some great programs, things that are available to help you on this journey um, because it's hard knowing how to direct your prayers and, and um, you know, uh, where to go sometimes. Another great tool that I am going to share today after you watch these three is to watch the movie War Room. Um, it'll help you in learning to pray, but also um, the story. It's an amazing story. And you can find that by going to treyerwilderness.com slash war room. So if you guys need prayers, please don't hesitate to leave them in the comments or email me at prayers at treyerwilderness.com or private message me. Um, we are very heavy on YouTube right now. So check us out on YouTube. If you're into trapping, you can find our trapping videos there. If you are not into trapping, don't even bother watching them. Um, just skip those and go on to the others. But there's a lot of videos being shared, a lot of great stuff going on. Um, that's part why my life is so crazy because I am editing all these videos. I think I've edited like 35 videos in the last three weeks. It's been pretty crazy. But I'm also going to be on Instagram, I think, a little more heavily sharing our day-to-day -day and our life and our photos. They will be feeding to Facebook, so those of you that are here on Facebook, you won't miss out. Um, but I'm going to be focusing on Instagram and YouTube and then keeping our Facebook Live here on Wednesdays. So that's where you will be able to find me um, when I'm online and around, uh, when I'm not uh, in the woods chasing animals and uh, trying to fill our freezer and sort our food. So. I'm going to say a prayer here, and you guys can get back to your day. Papa, I just thank you for all those that take the time to join me weekly and that share um, in this journey and share their thoughts and, and what they're walking out, their prayer requests, and just be with those and help them to uh, 
think out of the box, to think in a preparedness way on a day-to-day -day basis, not just when emergencies happen. Help them to think ahead and help them to prepare. And while they are preparing, that they keep you in the forefront and that they have you leading the way because living out a faith-led preparedness lifestyle means that you are leading the way. And then as we walk this out, be with those that are struggling in their marriage. Be with those that are wanting to get married and be with those that are are living a good marriage but are, are looking for changes. There's always improvement in anything we do, whether it's something with homesteading or whether it's our marriage. We can always improve and it should be our goal to always be improving the person we were the day before. And that aspect of things will carry through into our marriages and into our with our, our lives with our children and everything. And I just ask that you give everyone that's watching this the courage to embrace they, uh, do not understand what a walk like that looks like that they contact me. But give them the courage to embrace a faith-filled life, a life with you, a life with Jesus, and that they understand better and take the time to watch these three videos to understand what biblical marriage really looks like and how to attain it and how to keep it and how to um, even get your spouse on board. Sometimes it's hard enough to get a spouse on board in preparedness and it may be even harder to get a spouse on board when it comes to marriage and faith. But these videos were so well presented, I think that they will speak for themselves. So I just encourage them to take the time to watch them. And I will be praying for all of them as they embrace this journey and as we embrace this walk for the next several weeks. And just thank you for putting it on my heart to share this with them. And uh, may we all make a difference and be a light in, in the darkness that's around in this world. And... May we shine and, and may biblical marriage and the Bible and you become more prevalent in our world to uh, bring the peace back to this world that is so jaded. So just be with everyone and help them walk this out. Help them in their day to day. Strengthen those that need strength and heal those that need healing. And just wrap your loving arms around each and every one of them. And we thank you more than anything for what you're going to do moving forward and ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Okay, guys. Have a fabulous day. Thank you for joining me. If you feel this was of use, please share it. Um, the more people we can get understanding what biblical marriage really is and what it looks like and how it should be done, um, I think the stronger the family units we can build in this world. And having the men as the head of the household, I think, is so important and so, so vital um, in our world. Oh, that's funny, Tammy. I said earlier, Tammy just say, said amen. God bless you all. And I was thinking that you weren't on here today. Like I said, I'm off my rocker. I'm, I'm working at a pace that is not good for me because I'm losing my mind, but I think it was already lost a while ago, as a mountain man would say, so just bear with me. I hope you are feeling better, sweet friend. <laughs> so guys, have a good day. I look forward to seeing you next week. I will shoot for 10.30. Bye.